It's a shell game, corporate America's hidden profit center. The tax shelter business has become basically stealing from the Treasury. Hide and seek against the IRS. These were close to sham transactions. Some were clearly sham transactions. When they didn't pay, the burden fell on us. These guys are just complete freeloaders on the rest of us. They're paying a whole lot less than they used to, and the rest of us are picking up the tab for them. You could double everybody's refund if you just collected all the taxes that are due. Tonight on Frontline, correspondent Hedrick Smith follows the tax shelter trail to surprising places. So this is human waste, chemical waste. Uncovering the companies behind the tax it's schemes. The first Union, not Carolina. Discovering how the schemes were sold. And their response was, no, this is a clean deal. We're using the IRS laws against them. And unveiling what's really going on inside America's biggest tax firms. The elements of hiding the facts were really just blatant. At that point, I really realized some of the stuff that these guys are doing may very well be criminal. Tonight on Frontline, the great American tax dodge. Tax season, and the returns are starting to roll in at IRS centers all across the country. But there's a problem. Not everyone is honestly paying what they owe. Some big time taxpayers are gaming the system with illegitimate tax shelters and sticking the rest of us with the bill. Well, my reaction is, you know, more people are buying into this stuff than, than I thought, you know? And, and of course, the, the, the magnitude of it was, was, was very, very substantial. Republican businessman Charles Rosati recently spent five years as commissioner of internal revenue. While running his own technology company, Rosati had seen some dubious tax schemes. Well, of course, having been in business, I mean, I had, had, had people, you know, come in and try to sell me various things. I always believed in business. If it's too good to be true, it probably is too good to be true. But inside the IRS, Rosati was shocked to see how severely the epidemic of bogus tax shelters had infected the tax system. I think it's a huge danger to the tax system. What we learned from our agents, what we learned from the tax experts, what we learned from the honest practitioners was, was true. There were a heck of a lot of promoters marketing a heck of a lot of devices to a heck of a lot of corporations to shelter income so they wouldn't pay corporate taxes. It's a far cry from what you and I do. We struggle to hold down our taxes with legitimate deductions, IRAs, mortgage interest on our homes. But major corporations and boomtime millionaires zero out their taxes with tax tricks. And who cooks up the tricks? Highly respected accounting and law firms, the very people we trust to keep the system honest. So you and I wind up paying the difference, not just for shelters, but for the entire tax gap. The whole problem is anything that's, that's not being paid that should be paid. I mean, that's basically what the honest taxpayer is making up. That's, that's you know, uh, somewhere in the range of 250 to 300 billion a year, uh, which basically means that everybody is paying 15% more, if you want to look at it that way. 15% is a big chunk. Yeah, you could give everybody twice as big a refund as they average get if you just collected all the taxes that are due. And how big a part of this is the tax shelter problem? That is certainly the biggest single source of the uh, gap. They don't exactly hand you a roadmap to help you find these well-concealed tax shelters, which turn up in the most unexpected places. Our search begins in the industrial heartland of Germany, the city of Dortmund, where in late 1997, city officials were offered a deal they couldn't refuse. It's absolutely unbelievable. I still, to this day, can't believe that something like this works. Dortmund would get $10 million cash, like manna from heaven, for agreeing to lease its old streetcars to an American company. We give the streetcars to the USA and then you lease them back so we can still use them here. 
Dorman leased 65 streetcars to a U.S. investor and instantly leased them back. So Dortmund still owned and operated the streetcars. Nothing really happened. It's called a lilo, lease in, lease out. It is the same as before. Yes, it is very hard to understand if you are not from the banking business. It was hard to understand. Why would an American investor pay $150 million to lease 25-year-old streetcars that stayed in Dortmund? I found an expert, a German lawyer who works with U.S. investors on cross-border leasing deals, Dr. Markus Winserski. What is a cross-border leasing deal? What does it involve? Well, the basic idea is to create a tax benefit for a profitable uh, a U.S. domiciled company. For example, banks, financial institutions, or whatsoever. It's a huge business, more than $100 billion in Germany alone over the past five years. Winserski helped me understand how a deal works. If I understand you correctly, the lease of the German asset, the streetcar system, goes to America, but the lease goes back to Germany, so the Germans continue to run the subway system exactly. or the streetcar system. That's the basic and idea. And the money goes from America to Germany. Maybe it goes back through a Swiss bank, but then it goes back to America. Is that right? Exactly. Okay. exactly. So, the, so the, the asset goes away and comes home, and the money goes away and it comes home. Well, it's a very simple description, but essentially it's right. So is it a good deal financially? Well, uh, the, the focus is on, on the tax benefit uh, of the whole transaction and not on the exchange uh, of, of payments or services. The whole point of it is the tax benefit. Is that right? Uh, well, it doesn't work without the tax well, benefit. Well, it, it, it wouldn't work without the tax benefit, and that's the driver for the transaction. The tax benefit came from a fast write-off for the American investor's big upfront lease payment. But who was the American investor? That was a well-kept secret. In fact, the lease contract required secrecy. Even Dortmund city officials seemed unsure who was behind the deal. You don't know who the investor was? Nein, nein. Did you know who the investor was? Nein, auch wer auch wieder über die Deutsche Bank gelaufen. I suspect it was being done through Deutsche Bank or subsidiaries, but I'm not sure. Deutsche Bank, it turned out, was just the German middleman. Uh, Mr. Justus, I wonder if you recognize this document. Das sind Unterlagen, die offiziell These are official documents from this very meeting. In unserem Falle handelt es sich um eine. Then what's the heading? Der US Investor. And then what does it say after that? In unserem Falle handelt In our case, it is a big renowned American bank. First union with headquarters in North Carolina. Stammsitz in North Carolina. In the financial world, banking as we have known it has become a thing of the past. Brokerage. First Union Bank. In two decades, this upstart Carolina bank gobbled up a hundred regional competitors. Its aggressive acquisition strategy was led by former CEO Ed Crutchfield. Uh, you simply have to reinvent yourself or uh, change yourself so that you have the ability to compete with that New York crowd who had up till 19, about 90, been eating our lunch. That's the main thing it took, was nerve. I don't know. I mean, again, it took vision. You had to be able to think outside the box a bit. All of our financial institutions are in transition. So First Union rode the Wall Street wave of the 90s, moved beyond standard banking into investment banking, brokerage, and using sophisticated financial tools like leasing. It has helped investors seeking diversity. Leasing is, is really just another way of financing. You know, it's just another arrow in the quiver. Uh, it's another financing tool that we, that we offer. And as to why we would want to do that for, for a city in Germany, I don't know the specifics of that. But I read First Union had gotten about a billion dollars in fast tax write-offs from a bunch of leasing deals, including that deal in Dortmund. But as a CEO, you were certainly aware it was delivered. So I started to ask about the tax write-offs. I don't know that I could have told you what it meant to our bottom line. 
Do you make a $4 billion profit a year and something's delivering you a billion well, dollars? Rick, if you're going to do an investigative report, let's, let's change the subject. And talk Crutchfield about said he was unprepared, prepare for it, had not been forewarned about discussing taxes. The same subject, the interview is over. And cut off the interview. I wrote Crutchfield, asking him to take time to prepare and do another interview. But Crutchfield would not talk to us. Neither would the bank. So I went to see a watchdog on tax issues, Robert McIntyre, director of the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy. He said First Union's tax benefits from leasing were huge. Leasing was central to their tax sheltering strategy as far as their annual report reveals. From 1997 to 1998, First Union reports that it saved close to a billion and a half dollars in taxes from leasing. They were pretty aggressive at sheltering. That was enough to cut its tax rate in 1998 to only about 6%. It was almost, you know, down to nothing. First Union had plenty of company. The bull market of the 90s was a spawning ground for a shelter epidemic that swept through corporate America. As profits soared, companies were finding ingenious ways to lose money or appear to lose money. I saw what was called corporate tax shelters grow in the 90s. Uh, and I realized, and other professionals like me realized, it was not uh, what we used to think of as tax shelters in the days of old. Former Reagan Treasury official Buck Chapitan was troubled by the new tax tricks. These were a different uh, animal. These were close to sham transactions. Some were clearly sham transactions. Had nothing to do with investment. They simply were financial mechanisms for creating losses, uh, tax losses, no economic losses. Creating losses, phantom losses, suddenly became pivotal to impressing Wall Street. That alarmed the head of the New York tax bar, Harold Handler. What changed in the, in the 90s was that the tax line of the financial statement became a profit center for many corporations. How do you get your tax rate down? Exactly. That's the, that, that was what, what it was all about. You know, I want to have the lowest tax rate because I can produce the best results for my financial statements and my, my company. And if, if the fellow down the street is doing it, I should be able to do it also. And there was a tremendous amount of pressure to do that. And there still is. And the pressure was to manipulate the law. It may come as a surprise, but the law lets corporations keep two sets of books, a bullish book income report to Wall Street and a lowball tax income report to the IRS. Well, a company, let's say it makes $10 billion. That's what it tells the shareholders. But when it gets time to filling out its tax return, it tells the Internal Revenue Service that no, we only made $4 billion or $3 billion because it shelters most of its profits. And the result is, you know, you and I, we report our wages, all of it, nothing we can do about that. But companies say, hey, we're not telling the IRS we made all this money because we don't want to pay taxes on it. The corporate hunger to minimize taxes revolutionized the tax trade. A client would call with a transaction that was being promoted for purposes only to reduce taxes, having no business reality. That's bothersome because it changes the dynamic of what you're doing. You're now no longer doing real things, but you're doing artificial transactions for the purpose of reducing tax only. Artificial transactions an all-important dividing line between bogus tax sheltering and legitimate tax planning. The difference is that when you're tax planning a, a business transaction for a corporation, there's a real transaction. There's something that really is being accomplished. In the new game of fabricated shelters, moving money from box to box, the key players were the firms which created and sold tax tricks the tax professionals were the culprits. The accounting firms, some law firms, both good accounting firms and good law firms were, in the, uh, were uh, promoters of these transactions. They would go and sell a product to a particular company and reap a million dollar fee, and it became addictive. It was like opium. As Hewlett Packard's tax vice president for 22 years, Larry Langdon was pitched plenty of shady tax schemes. And there were a number of of, of CFOs, CEOs, and others who realized it was going on and it was wrong. But, um, but frankly, uh, I would say a, a, a fair number 
almost half of the major companies were, were succumbing to that sort of pressure. The increase in abusive shelters and use of legitimate deductions was fueling an even bigger trend, a sharp decline in corporate tax rates, according to public records. Well, on paper, the corporate tax rate is 35%, but because there's so many loopholes, so many shelters, well, we did a study uh, looking at companies through 1998, the 250 of the biggest, and their average rate by 1998 was 20%, not 35 and lately, we think the rate is down to about 15. In other words, companies are paying less than half of what they're supposed to. Some companies paid zero taxes. Others even got tax rebates. And as the corporate tax payments plummeted, so did the corporate share of the total tax take. From 1950 to 2000, corporations averaged about 17% of the federal taxes. And all of a sudden, now, down to 7%. 7% of the government paid for by corporate taxes. So yeah, they're paying a whole lot less than they used to and the rest of us are picking up the tab for it. And what was the IRS doing about all this? In the late 90s, the IRS that Charles Rosati found was in a state of crisis, deeply on the defensive. Just as the Scheller epidemic was taking off, Congress attacked the IRS and cut its budget. It was in a situation where people were a little bit hunkered down. They were, they were like people that were in a foxhole with a lot of incoming artillery shells uh, coming in. The IRS pulled in his horns. It was so hopelessly understaffed and outgunned that Rosati said it couldn't even keep up with tax cheats. The IRS, you know, simply does not have enough resources broadly to cover even the most serious compliance cases which means that, you know, people are robbing banks on all four corners, we'll only be able to stop one robber. To try to combat tax shelters, Rosati enlisted one of the tax trade veterans, Hewlett Packard's Larry Langdon. I wanted to tackle the tax shelter problem, and I found that the IRS was way behind the times with regard to what I knew was going on in the corporate sector. We were playing, you know, like man-to-man -man defense. I mean, the IRS was like taking a knife into a gunfight. I mean, you know, we were, had one, you know, a couple of agents, you know, here fighting against, uh, you know, major, well-staffed, well-organized corporations and tax advisors. Worse, it was so overwhelmed by paper that it couldn't even spot the phony shelters. Tax lawyer and analyst for the journal Tax Notes, Lee Shepard. Finding the transactions is a problem. I mean. It, if you're talking a Fortune 100 company, the return would be floor-to-ceiling paper. Even if you're under continuous audit, it's not like the corporate tax manager is going to say, oh, look over here, here's the tax shelter. <laughs> That's not what they get paid to do. I mean, I don't want to apply that everybody's always hiding the ball, but sometimes, you know, hiding the ball is what you're trying to do. Hiding the ball. Remember that streetcar deal in Dortmund? They hid the investor. They buried the shelter in tax returns. That's why the IRS had so much trouble tracking the leasing business. IRS agents just stumbled into the first hints of trouble while screening returns. You could see the leasing activity changed. We didn't know what kind of change it was. We just knew taxpayers were getting more heavily involved in leasing. And they got to lease it back, so they got to make a payment. Kerry Allen, a senior tax auditor at the IRS Center in Charlotte, North Carolina, was like Sherlock Holmes trying to unravel the leasing deals. And we saw a, a change in the trend for description of leasing. It was going along at a certain rate per year, and then we saw a graph, kind of like a graph that goes up. So you Big know, jump in activity. Well, it starts slow and then it starts rising. So you knew there was a change in business practice a change that involved big tax breaks. They get up to $100 million a transaction, $500 million, and some of them end up being billion-dollar transactions. There are a number of heroes in this whole exercise, and Kerry Allen is one of them. He discovered, uh, on the part of the IRS, the first lease-in, lease-out transaction. And frankly, he was tenacious enough to pursue it, understand all of the documentation, and put the jigsaw puzzle together. We said, we got to get an answer to this. This is a problem, because it appears to us as agents, nothing is really happening here. That this is not really a lease like we've ever seen before. So this is all going in a circle. So this draws our attention. 
Allen is forbidden to talk about specific companies or tax audits, but he sketched out a typical LILO deal. I'm not going to count it for tax purposes. Right. It's complicated, but he showed me why he believed it was a sham financial transaction. We don't think anything's going to happen or nothing's really happening because we're Paper shuffling without genuine business purpose, not a legitimate shelter. They really don't have to move any money. They're just making journal entries. It's the circular flows of money, basically remove the risk out of the transaction. Uh, the money was not used like you normally see in a leasing arrangement. Well, and that, that's just plain wrong. Ken Keese, John, how are you doing? Ken Keese is a Capitol Hill veteran, now a spokesman and Washington lobbyist for the leasing industry, working hard to protect their leasing deals. They They're very complicated transactions. They're heavily negotiated. They, in each case, they have legal opinions from very reputable law firms. Those transactions very comfortably fit within 30 years of leasing law. Weren't the American investors getting their major gain out of the tax reduction benefit of these cross-border leasing deals? Well, the answer is that that's certainly a significant part of it, and that's true in every lease. I mean, and it has been for 30 years. But the IRS did not buy that argument. On audit, it challenged 300 LILOs by more than 30 banks and corporations. In May 1999, it issued a regulation specifically barring LILOs. In effect, what that did was create a major chill with regard to selling any of those transactions in the future. So we killed it for the future. In all, the IRS banned more than two dozen types of tax shelters. It even won a few court cases against big corporations. But it was like cat and mouse, always a jump or two behind. So hasn't the IRS banned about 28 transactions, put them out in a public list and said these won't work? Yes. But as fast as the IRS can publish that list, the promoters can come up with transactions that are different, sufficiently different that they don't fit within that, those, those guidelines. So they change a little thing here and change a little thing there and... That's right. That's exactly right. And it's a constant game. It just keeps going on and on. So, Joe, tell me, where are we? We're at uh, Marina Bay yeah. in uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Yeah. The promoters had found oh, yes. a new market, a oh, new yeah. niche for their tax yeah. tricks. Yeah. Individuals who struck it rich, like entrepreneur Joe Jacoboni. How long is this one? And what kind of crew does this have? You got a captain? A captain, an engineer, a first mate, uh, two stewardesses, and a chef. Oh, so you got the whole works. Yes. Yeah. It's a five-star hotel on the water. And this is the, uh, this is the sun deck. Ah, uh, great. So you must have done well in business to wind up with a boat like this. Tell me about your business. Well, in uh, 1991, I pretty much uh, leveraged everything I owned, borrowed money uh, from everybody I knew, and uh, started the company on about $50,000. His company, and, uh, which provided tech company, support for the skyrocketing computer uh, industry, uh, took off. And six years later, Jacoboni uh, cashed in. How much did Cincinnati Bell pay? Uh, the end, the, the final price was $32 million. $28 million of it was mine. And I put the money in the bank. And who was your banker? First Union. First Union was your banker? Yes, sir. Who are we? We're First Union. Helping our neighbors in every way we can. So it was amazing how many people came out of the woodwork that uh, had great ideas what to do with the money. Uh, they had been a trusted bank for many, many years with me, and so I uh, pretty much kept the money with them. First Union steered Jacoboni into a tax scheme devised by the bank's own auditor, one of the country's top accounting firms, and one of the most aggressive in marketing tax shelters, KPMG. I got a phone call from the senior tax person at KPMG, Carolyn Brennan, and they just told me that this was an investment strategy and that it was going to cost me um, X millions of dollars. What KPMG called an investment strategy would cost Jacoboni $2.4 million, but it would eliminate all of the capital gains tax he owed on the sale of his company, more than $7 million. I asked him questions like, has this ever been audited? And their response was, no, this is a clean deal. We've done, we've done numerous deals like this with people that are in exactly your situation. It's never been audited. 
So they're saying this is perfectly in compliance with IRS rules and regulations? Absolutely. Absolutely. The word bulletproof was used at one point in time. To seal the deal, KPMG promised the blessing of a top-shelf law firm. The terminology they used, Rick, was there was a more likely than not chance I would win an audit. But off the record, their attitude was, Joe, you have no problems, we're KPMG, we would never do anything to put you in a position to where you would be in trouble with the IRS. All the same, KPMG wasn't taking chances of the IRS finding out. It told Giacoboni to keep it all confidential. He says he couldn't even show the deal to his own accountant. Because they said it was proprietary, that they had created it, and that uh, they, they just were not, they were not going to share it with anybody. In September 1997, Giacoboni took the leap. He ponied up his $2.4 million. Right. Where are you sending this money? to various and sundry situations. I'm sending it to a company called Jacaranda Corporation. Which is? Um, I have no idea. And where is it? Uh, the Cayman Islands. And what do you think it's doing? Quite honestly, Rick, I didn't know what the transaction was doing. All I knew is KPMG was managing the transaction and telling me, you need to put this money here, put that money there. To check out Jacaranda, I flew to Grand Cayman Island, an international tax haven where you can set up and disband a company in a New York minute. Once a sleepy British colony, Cayman today claims to be the world's fifth largest financial center with $1 trillion a year in bank turnover. Jacaranda had been created as a conduit for the KPMG tax scheme sold to Jacoboni. In the hunt for Jacoboni's Cayman Company, my first stop was the Government Registry of Companies. I'm, I'm looking for information about Jacaranda Capital. It's okay. a company, yeah. Jacaranda Capital. So it's a company that was set up in 1997. Well, let me see if one of the assistants is available. Because I Typical Wall Street information about company operations and owners was not available. But there was a listing of Jacaranda's registered office, the local law firm of Maples and Calder. So I went to see its managing partner, Anthony Travers. How many lawyers do you have working here? In this Legal office, staff? we have about, about 250 okay. here. Uh -huh. We have 10 lawyers in London. We have 10 lawyers in Hong Kong. So you have about 250 in this area? Yeah, Jack? exactly. exactly yeah. Including, including I'm interested in a company. It's called Jacaranda. Maples and Calder was listed as its registered office. Can you help me find out about that company? Can you no, tell me I, anything I, about that company? I really can't because of the legitimate right to privacy. Can you tell me anything about who its directors are? Can you tell me, no. can you tell me about it, what its purpose of business is? No. Um, what can you tell me? It so happens that that is what the confidentiality law says. It, it, it endeavors to establish a, a right to privacy, and actually I commit a criminal offense if I breach that law. That was a dead end. So I asked Travers to take a look at some documents we had turned up. I'm not going to ask you how you got these. <laughs> they were minutes of Jacaranda's first board meeting. Two attorneys from Travers' law firm had incorporated the company. I asked about its two listed directors. They are directors of uh, an institution in the Cayman Islands, uh, which is in the business of providing directors, which is this one listed here, which one? Queensgate Bank and Trust <clears throat> Company. Limited. Queensgate Bank and Trust Company, what is, they provide directors? Yes, they do. So if you're in America and you want to set up a company and you don't want to have to come here and you want to have directors, you go to Queensgate. It provides independent directors who... So Jacaranda was not just a ready-made company. It had ready-made directors. Oh, well, at least but th this, this, is, this looks like a fairly standard corporate transaction, uh, having flicked through these papers. Um, so this happens dozens of times, hundreds of may, times. May, may well be, yes. And Travers Law Firm had cozy ties to Jacaranda's directors. Uh, of, what's interesting to me is the address of the, of the meeting of the board of directors is the same as the address of your law firm. I think if, if you look out of the window, you'll, you'll probably see them in the building next door. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, at the time this was happening, they were we're on another... Actually, we're actually tenants of theirs. 
What's more, Travers said, his firm had little reason to look too closely at Jack Aranda and its business dealings because KPMG vouched for it. You mean it wasn't your responsibility? It wasn't, it wasn't our primary obligation or responsibility to redo the engineering in relation to matters of U.S. taxation. Or to look that closely at a Jack Aranda if it came to you from KPMG? Uh, I think if it came from KPMG, we would make certain assumptions about the propriety of the transaction, yes. Yeah. That's correct. Back home, Giacoboni made similar assumptions about KPMG. But around the time he bought into KPMG's tax scheme, IRS lawyers were starting to take a dim view of such shelters. Called basis shifting, the scheme involved a quick in-and-out stock deal by the Cayman Company that supposedly generated phantom paper losses for Giacoboni to offset his real capital gains. It turns on a legal construct that, that creates a loss. You go through two legal entities and have a liquidation and generate an artificial loss. That's the substance of, of a basis shift. However you want to characterize it, you You're are talking. talking about a transaction that, but for the tax, you would not do. Well, is this thing a sham? Is this a distortion of the law? Is this turning the rules upside down and twisting them? Twisting the rules, yes. It is, it is twisting the rules. For three years, the government's probe into basis-shifting schemes went unknown to Joe Giacoboni. Then the bombshell, a notice from the IRS. Giacoboni frantically called his KPMG advisor, Carolyn Brannan. We started the conversation out with, you know, I can't believe this is happening. You know, Carolyn, tell me why, what, what went wrong? Do they have a case? And Carolyn's response was, Joe, they're so stupid. They can't even figure out this deal. They've been trying to figure it out for two and a half years. I said, Carolyn, two and a half years? I said, this is August of 2001. Are you telling me that you knew the IRS was questioning this transaction? In the beginning of 1998, there was silence on the phone. Well, well, they've been aware, we've been aware that they knew about this transaction, and they have not been able to figure it out since then. Wait a minute, did she say anything how you were doing an audit? Th that was my next question, is, is like, well, you know, am I going to lose the audit? She says, most definitely you'll lose the audit. She says you're going to lose oh, yeah. the audit? Absolutely. So now... I am absolutely going ballistic. I'm like, I'm seeing $7.2 million. God knows what the interest rate was going to be, 40% penalties. And I'm like, Carolyn, you know, I'm going to fight it. Carolyn Brannon referred Frontline's questions to KPMG. KPMG declined an interview. In a court document, it denied Giacoboni's version of events. But Giacoboni says KPMG recommended that he pay the taxes he owed, then sue the IRS. Um, you guys are going to defend the audit for me? Of course, Joe will defend the audit. I'm like, are you, you guys are going to pay for this, right? Of course not, Joe. They're not going to pay? No. She said, Joe, you are responsible for an audit. You're going to have to pay us for it. That was too much for Giacoboni. He decided to sue, not the IRS, but KPMG. That's when he learned from internal KPMG memos that KPMG quality control had long held grave doubts about the tax scheme sold to Giacoboni, a basis-shifting scheme called FLIP. But, uh, quote, Larry DeLop determined that KPMG should discontinue marketing the existing product. The existing product was the deal they sold you. FLIP. It's called FLIP. Right. So he's saying that in the fall of 97, their quality guy is saying to the rest of the outfit in KPMG, stop selling this thing. Right, and I believe it was sometime in September before they even sold me the program that they were told to stop selling it. So they're selling you stuff that they're saying internally they know doesn't work. Right. Their fees were more important than their integrity and honesty to their client and protecting their clients, so let's keep on selling it. If the IRS doesn't audit it, we're fine. And KPMG did just that. It sold more than 160 wealthy individuals the same deal as Giacoboni, including the late race car driver Dale Earnhardt and William Simon, former Republican candidate for governor of California. So a lot of folks are going to look at this who haven't been as fortunate or as successful as you are and say, hey, Joe, you made $28 million. You were just trying to get out of your taxes. Rick, I did what every American does every year. 
we go to tax accountants because the code's so complex that they have to interpret it. So I trusted the quality and reputation of one of the largest accounting firms in the world. I guess you can't even do that anymore. I don't know who you trust. All the same. Completely identical. First it was sheep. Now it's tax advice. Everybody was in the game. At KPMG, tax shelters were top priority the firm's hottest profit center. The whole culture was driven by sales. This sounded like a great idea for supercharging the tax practice. Stop waiting for people to call you and give them an answer. Let's go out and sell a lot more product. Let's get out there and sell it proactively. Tax lawyer Mike Hammersley witnessed the KPMG tax shelter machine from the inside. In 1998, he was wooed away from Ernst & Young. I thought it was a good opportunity. I had uh, friends at uh, KPMG. I was excited to, uh, uh, to, to come over and work with them and work in this field. They were well-respected people. Hammersley joined the brain trust of the KPMG tax practice, the Washington National Tax Office. And right from the start, what he saw bothered him. Actually, the very first project that I was given was a tax shelter, a uh, very aggressive tax shelter. What I was shocked about was the willingness to accept facts and representations that they knew to be false. Hammersley recalled having told KPMG colleagues that their shelter schemes wouldn't work legally. One of the ways in which you can identify as a tax shelter is ask yourself, would anyone in their right mind <laughs> do one of these transactions uh, but for the tax benefits or if those losses were real losses? Would anyone do that? Would you be able to sell that? And the answer, almost always is, is no. Hammersley said KPMG's hottest shelters were hush-hush, even to insiders. The most abusive tax shelters were fairly clandestine. Clandestine because? Because the really ugly stuff, they would, they, there were, there's restrictions on access. Um, they didn't want their own people to know? They did not want their own people to know. What's going on here? What's the practice here and why is this happening? One of the things that's going on is not wanting the strategy to leak out to another promoter. Uh, the other thing is, is not wanting it to leak out to the IRS. Keeping the IRS in the dark was critical to KPMG's sales strategy. The firm calculated that it would be better off financially to ignore IRS requirements to register its tax shelters. The penalties associated with not registering paled in comparison to the revenues that would be generated by these tax shelters that had to be registered. And if they were registered, KPMG decided they couldn't sell them. So they made a business decision not to register them. In internal memos, KPMG made the cold calculation that penalties would be less than 10% of its fees. Business flourished. Revenues at the tax practice climbed to more than $1.2 billion, a 45% jump in just three years. And the more money KPMG made, the less money Uncle Sam collected. The fees that KPMG got was determined specifically and exclusively on the amount of tax savings that they generated for the tax shelter purchase. This, to me, was the, the nail in their coffin. The, the phony, deceptive device that they created was profitable to them to the extent to which there was a loss. The greater the loss, the greater the money that KPMG made. This hearing of the Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations is called to order. I want to thank Senator Carl Levin of Michigan spearheaded a probe of tax shelter abuses by the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations. The testimony today will also show the lengths to which KPMG went to hide its tax products and its sales efforts from the IRS. Last fall, the committee called major accounting firms on the carpet. KPMG, Ernst & Young, PricewaterhouseCoopers. The others apologized. And we have learned from our mistakes. KPMG insisted it had done nothing illegal. Second, it's true that these strategies were complicated and that the tax consequences turned on careful and detailed analyses of highly technical tax laws, regulations, rulings, and court opinions. But all of these tax strategies were consistent with the laws in place at the time. But after a year of probing thousands of company documents, Levin was unconvinced. 
We found a very pervasive use of tax avoidance schemes that were designed and cooked up and concocted by otherwise uh, supposedly legitimate accounting firms uh, and uh, investing firms. Now, you focused in your investigation heavily on KPMG. Why KPMG? We had uh, subpoenaed a lot of materials from a lot of firms, and we uh, decided that this was one of the worst perpetrators. Perhaps the biggest shock was KPMG's crass marketing. Instead of letting clients ask for tax advice, KPMG set up a telemarketing center to cold call new prospects. I mean, it's pretty obscene to me that you got a firm like KPMG that goes through telemarketing to persuade taxpayers who made a big capital gain or made some big income that they can reduce their tax bill if they'll follow a scheme which KPMG has devised. And Hammersley reported that the KPMG High Command was calling the shots on Scheller promotion. It was driven from the top. It was coming from the top guy in the tax practice, Jeff Stein. They would have conference calls where he would demand uh, an explanation of why you were not adequately selling the tax shelters. Stein did so well with the tax practice that in 2000 he was promoted to number two in KPMG's entire U.S. operation. Jeff Stein's uh, objective was to change the mind frame of a tax professional from finding problems with transactions and trying to address them objectively to going out and proactively selling tax shelters and um, trying to close sales. Stein and top KPMG partners declined to be interviewed by Frontline. But Mike Hammersley, by now a senior manager in KPMG's Los Angeles office, said things went from bad to worse. The activities got more and more aggressive, and the elements uh, with a particular promoter in the Los Angeles office, the elements of hiding the facts uh, were, were really just blatant. And uh, that, that's when it really finally hit home. Wow, you know, some of the stuff that these guys are doing may very well be criminal. And you went home? Uh, went home uh, thinking, uh, you know, how did I get here? This was an industry that survived in the past, prior generations, on, uh, on its ethics and integrity. How did, the, how did the industry get here? And how did I get here? This was just not what I bargained for. The defining moment, Hammersley says in court documents came when KPMG superiors demanded that he sign off on tax matters that he considered illegal, a charge KPMG disputed. I had no choice. I had to blow the whistle, and uh, um, you know, the consequences of that result were, were expected. In October 2002, KPMG put Hammersley on paid leave. Hammersley sued KPMG, charging the firm had ruined his reputation. A settlement was reached. KPMG's tax services and offerings. Today, Last KPMG fall, KPMG, which is facing federal investigation, told Congress that it had stopped mass marketing aggressive tax shelters. We no longer offer or implement aggressive look-alike tax strategies. In a corporate shakeup, it removed several key tax partners. As for Mike Hammersley, KPMG said he wasn't qualified to discuss tax shelters because he hadn't been involved. Although I wasn't directly involved in the marketing of the tax shelters, I got a close look at many of the strategies, and I was surrounded by the people who were directly involved in the shelters. That's the basis of my information. You don't have to be a bank robber to understand and, and observe a bank robbery. Remember the bogus leasing deals the IRS thought it had shut down in 1999? Well, the industry adapted. And in Paris last fall, I found leasing industry insiders gathering at a five-star hotel for a conference on cross-border leasing. Leasing lobbyist Ken Keyes flew in from Washington. The people primarily represented here are people that help structure the transactions. Um, they're from all over the world. There's people here from uh, Australia, the United States, Europe. Number one, how important the leasing industry is to the U.S. economy, and second... Many were eager to hear Keyes tell them how changes in American tax law would affect their future deals. Keyes assured them that the leasing industry had the ear of powerful U.S. lawmakers. We were very aggressive at going and meeting with every member of the House leadership, from Speaker Hastert um, through Tom DeLay, who's second in charge, Roy Blunt, who's the third in charge. I was surprised by how many new opportunities the leasing industry had found. 
So it looks like the leasing business is doing real well in Europe right now. It's in the many billions of dollars, I would guess 20, 30 billion, maybe bigger. So there was still plenty of assets to lease in Europe. But how is the industry planning to stay out of trouble with the IRS? Getting an answer took a while. Back in Germany, I found one in the city of Bochum, just 20 miles down the road from Dortmund. Like many cities, Bochum found itself in a financial pinch in 2002. We didn't have enough money to do all the things we had to do as our duties as a com community to the people in Bochum. So we were looking for ways out of that dilemma, and one of them was the idea of trying to go get into a financial deal on the way of cross-border leasing. The idea of cross-border leasing wasn't unusual. What was unusual was the city asset that U.S. investors wanted to lease. Mr. Albert, where are we right now? Wir stehen in einem Bochumer Kanalsystem, das ist 1200 Kilometer lang. We are standing in the Bochum sewer system, which is about 1200 kilometers long and close to downtown Bochum. The Bochum lease wasn't about streetcars. And, and tell me, Herr Albach, what did the Americans lease? They have leased the pipes, there are different tubes, different parts of the system. So, what is in this water? This is human waste, chemical waste? This is not industrial waste. It is only from people. By leasing its sewer pipes for half a billion dollars, Bochum got a $20 million fee. But Vice Mayor Gabriel Reidel opposed the deal. Why do you object to the cross-border leasing deal? Well, one thing, it is um, only a, a deal for a tax shelter in the United States. And I say it is a bad example to the people in Bochum, because I want them to pay their taxes honestly. So, so you think the, the main reason for this deal is a tax shelter in America? Yes, I'm sure. This what? is also what was told to us. Who are the American investors? Do you know? No, I don't know. We were not told who they are. They told they don't want to be named. And so the city accepted that? The city council accepted that? Yes, we were told if, if we want to make the deal, we have to accept this. But Frontline has learned that the U.S. investor in Bochum Sewers was... First Union is now Wachovia. Wachovia. An uncommon approach to banking. Well, Wachovia, amazingly, in 2002, even though it reported $4 billion in profits, reported that it didn't pay any taxes and, in fact, got a tax rebate from the government of about $160 million. How much were they actually writing off from leases at Wachovia? Well, they said they saved $3 billion in taxes over the last three years from leasing, so huge write-offs. But if Lilo leasing deals had been banned by the IRS, how could banks like Wachovia still be working that angle to cut their taxes? Wachovia declined to talk to Frontline, so I asked that German lawyer. The reason is uh, we started with the, uh, with the LILO deals, lease-in, lease-out structures. Then certain changes uh, in the American tax law happened, uh, which made uh, our uh, um, uh, colleagues in the uh, United States from the tech side saying that we better should move to a service contract structure. Well, they, they've changed the structure instead of a what we call the lease in and lease out. They've changed the structure a little bit, but from what we can tell at this point, they're still doing something very similar that they were doing with the Lilos. Don't think the government's going to get serious. To but leasing point. lobbyist Ken Keyes disagrees. These are different transactions. They have different terms. The economics are different and a different set of rules apply. So, so the industry moved to something that... It evolved. It, the it, industry evolved, is a way to put it. They are doing a different economic transaction, which is governed by a different set of tax rules. Well, the guts of it is pretty much the same as it was before. You've still got 
you still got nothing going on and your American corporate customer basically buying itself some deductions. They happen to be depreciation deductions rather than rent deductions, but you're, you're still just buying deductions. Is it correct that the basic structure of the deal is essentially the same even though on the surface one looks like a lease in, lease out, and the other is called a service contract? Yeah, I, I would say so. It's, it's, it's a basic, the basic structure is a lease structure and uh, there are certain amendments which had to be made just to uh, uh, make it possible to enjoy the uh, tax benefits. Same structure, same problem. Something didn't smell right. It was hard to see the economic substance and business purpose down there in the Bochum sewer. Cleaning up the mess of illegitimate tax shelters is still unfinished business in Washington and Charles Rosati is worried. I think this thing is going to rebound, especially as the economy improves. The fundamental drivers of this are, are still, still there. I mean, it's still a very profitable business for the promoters. There's still a tremendous amount of tax that could be saved. The law is still way too weak and too murky. Rosati says Congress must take strong action, pass legislation banning tax shelters with no clear business purpose and economic substance. Congress has to say it plain and simple, you know, plain and simple that, you know, if you're just doing a transaction that's structured for tax benefits that you wouldn't do in the absence of the tax benefits, then, then, it's, then it's a tax shelter and it's, it's not legitimate. I say to the hucksters, it's time to find an honest living. Republican Charles Grassley of Iowa led the GOP-dominated Senate to pass a bill that includes an economic substance rule and stiffer penalties for shelter promoters. But industry is fighting that bill. You're talking about powerful accounting firms, powerful legal firms, powerful investment bankers in a conspiracy to promote these tax shelters. They also have a fourth arm. They hire some of the most powerful lobbyists in town uh, to uh, work against this legislation. So broad tax shelter reform remains bottled up in the House Ways and Means Committee. The Bush administration proposes closing some loopholes and stiffer penalties. But some say that's just not enough. Congress needs to act. They need to outlaw tax shelters, period. You need also the administration, whoever's in power, to go after these guys, to call in these guys, to call in the heads of the accounting firm, the heads of the accounting practice and the law practice. They ought to be called into the White House and say, this is shameful stuff, folks. This has got to stop. Next time on Frontline... Today, Iraq is free. It was a stunning military success. Coalition forces toppled Saddam in just 22 days. But when the invasion was over, the war had just begun. When you decapitated the regime, everything below it fell apart. Did the Pentagon's miscalculations and how it fought the war create this brutal peace? The invasion of Iraq. Next time on Frontline. To order Frontline's Tax Me If You Can on video cassette or DVD, call PBS Home Video at 1 800 Play PBS. Support for Frontline is provided by U.S. News and World Report. Trust. For over 70 years, a commitment to playing it straight, getting it right. U.S. News and World Report. Trust matters. Partial funding for this program was provided by the Nathan Cummings Foundation. Frontline is made possible by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.